particle physics. And this is the this is the no man's land right up to the so-called Planck scale, which is where our theories are weak today, actually. We don't know those theories. And this is something about which string theory has a lot to say. Okay, so this is a chart of the scales. We were going down in length scales. Gravity took us in the other direction, you know, almost the same in terms of orders of magnitude. Okay. Now what happens is the following. You have two good theories of nature. One is quantum mechanics and one is general relativity. Both of them are very good in the regimes of description. But when you try to put the things together, which is necessary for us to understand the question of the origin of the universe, for example, or the question of the theory of elementary particles, you know, at very short length scales, there is a problem. There is a mathematical problem. These two theories are not consistent. And uh, unfortunately, it is general relativity that has to give way. And quantum mechanics survives. Why? What happens? So, you know, I just, I didn't know how to really explain all this to you because these things are pretty mathematical, but uh, you know, just imagine that fabric of space-time I talked about, that smooth stuff, that rubbery stuff. Now just imagine that that smooth stuff becomes very crinky, you know. And it's fluctuating all the time. It's very crinky. And uh, those fluctuations are because of the fuzziness of quantum mechanics, okay? What happens is, it turns out that these fluctuations cannot be controlled in a mathematically precise way. And that is why the general theory of relativity really breaks down. It's not that uh, you have to really incorporate this stuff. It's just wrong simply. It doesn't work because it gives you infinite answers. So that's one important problem. What do you do? So you search for a new paradigm. Whenever you find in the history of science, you know, a contradiction in theory, then you look for a better theory which contains the lower theories in the sense of their validity as an approximation. So how do you discover this theory? How do you discover a theory which is consistent with quantum mechanics and uh, also gives rise to general relativity? Better because general relativity is correct in the large, right? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> We need a consistent framework to develop a theory for exploring some very basic questions. It's a description of the origin of the universe. If there are some questions at the end, we can discuss this. is a very tricky issue here. Where the curvature of space-time would be very large. And, uh, you know, we live in flat space-time, you know, space-time ordinary life. And if you apply the general relativity equations and quantize them, you get some difficulties. And then there is this last thing which I will discuss in some detail with you because it's easy to tell you a little bit, is that there are fundamental difficulties uh, in reconciling the physics of black holes and quantum mechanics. So we'll come to that. Uh, so how much time do I have? How much time do you need? Well, I mean... <laughs> Till I drop it. For us to understand this. No, but uh, I mean... Uh, if you, if you need a break, you can take that and come back. Okay, so now we begin our lecture on string theory. So, uh, what is string theory? So, it's a new framework for fundamental physics. Okay. And uh, it was uh, disco discovered in a very, very accidental and uh, serendipitous way in the 1960s. Now I won't tell you the history, it's a fascinating history. But uh, string theory was supposed to describe the theory of strong interactions, but it didn't really do that. But it turns out to be a new paradigm. It contains general relativity, as I said, and is consistent with quantum mechanics. And it provides a framework for posing and formulating all fundamental questions of physics at fundamental length scales, okay? So it's a framework, it's not a theory. This is a very important point. You know, Newton's framework, I told you, was in terms of inertial reference frames. 
the simultaneity of time. But then he wrote down a theory of gravitation. Okay. I am talking to you about the framework at the moment, really, and not about a law that operates in that framework. Okay. And uh, now, what is string theory? Uh, <clears throat> so, as I said in the beginning of this talk, that the basic way in which we formulate the laws of nature usually is in terms of point particles. And then you put lots of particles together and talk of fluid mechanics and stuff like that. So there's a paradigm shift over here that string theory basically says that the building blocks of nature are not only uh, point-like objects, but they are extended objects. And the dimension of those extended objects can go all the way from 0 to 9. 0 is point, 1 dimension is string, Two dimensions is a membrane and so on. Okay. Now, why 9 comes out is a big story, so just believe me. Now, as I said already that, uh, I've, that these are the building blocks and the simplest one is the one dimensional object called the string. So it's a really a misnomer to say it's a string theory because that only refers to just one aspect of it actually. Okay. But that was what was discovered in the beginning, so the name stuck simply. Now, let's try to understand what is going on here. Uh, so let's take the simplest example of strings. One dimensional object, there can be only two behaviors. It can be either open or it can be closed, right? That's all. Now, you're all familiar with uh, strings in daily life. Like it's a violin string. You pluck it and you have harmonics actually. You have modes of the string, right? So these modes get interpreted in this theory this is just a cartoon okay as particles so string theory has lots and lots of particles actually very very massive particles which correspond to these modes the low lying particles are the particles of our world actually okay so just just to tell you a little bit about what it is because now the lecture will be a little difficult actually huh but uh, so whenever you have an object in physics, you ask, what is the spectrum? You know? What is the spectrum of that object? What are its modes like? So here is that slide, which if not true, I wouldn't be talking to you. This is the key point. That if you look at the spectrum of a closed string over here, and this is the angular momentum of the state and this is the square of the mass and there is a mass zero j equal to two particle in the spectrum and for open strings there is a mass zero and uh, j equal to one particle now anybody who works in particle physics or you know has some such uh, modern physics education will immediately realize that there is something very deep going on here that this is the spin of the graviton. This object is a graviton. It is the quantum of the general theory of relativity. Okay. And uh, this is the quantum of Maxwell's theory, the photon. This is a great discovery actually, that uh, string theory has the basic tenets of the general theory of relativity and also of the Maxwell theory and its generalization which we use in the theory of elementary particles. Okay, so this is the reason why string theory is important for nature. Because of this existence of this spin 2 particle, it contains general relativity. I mean, this is not very easy to see, but uh, it can be done. Okay, and then how does string theory cure all these problems of general relativity? Because it's an extended object, you see. They never really interact at points. So the interaction is really, you know, stretched out. If you have a stretched out interaction, the theory is good. And uh, just believe me, it works. It works. All the problems of the Einstein theory of general relativity in the small, in the small, can be resolved using this new framework. Okay. And... Uh, you know, string theories are consistently formulated in 9 plus 1 dimensions. And you might wonder actually that our world is 3 plus 1. So what happens with the other 6 dimensions? And so 
is a little cartoon that actually if you look very, very, if you can invent an experimental microscope, you will be able to discover the higher dimensions. Because just imagine, just imagine uh, that rod over there, you know, on which this, uh, on which this uh, amplifier is there. So, uh, you know, if you go very close to it, it will look like a two-dimensional object, right? Check the surface. But from a very long distance, it just appears like a line. So, there is a sort of a dimensional reduction depending upon the resolution you have of that object. So, you may be living in a world of higher dimensions, but your resolution is not good enough to detect it. So that's the idea, actually, of why a theory which lives in 9 plus 1 dimensions can be consistently understood in 3 plus 1 dimensions. Okay, so just wanted to tell you a little bit about string theory. So this is, so we were at quantum mechanics, we discussed a little bit of string theory, we saw how it sort of uh, resolves some of the problems of the Einstein theory. And now I want to tell you something about what are the achievements of string theory. You know, you know, people are working on this abstract theory for Years now, it's uh, since uh, 1985, even our group has been working. And uh, you might wonder actually that what does it have to do with nature? Okay. So, this is a very difficult question actually because uh, the nature that you want to describe uh, is experimentally inaccessible. So, there are no guiding principles from experiment actually because you want to describe space-time at very short distances. So the theoretical physicist actually once again recourses to trying to vindicate the verity of his theory by using it to resolve a very important contradiction. And this contradiction comes about once again when you apply quantum mechanics to the theory of black holes. So, why black holes are interesting? Because firstly, they are predictions of Einstein's theory. There are solutions of Einstein's theory which are black holes. Something which Einstein had opposed tooth and nail. But uh, they are there, it's correct. And secondly, not only because Einstein's theory predicts it, but they are in the sky. Black holes are in the sky. Black holes of a few solar masses all the way to millions of times solar masses which are called the AGNs, which are fueling the center of big galaxies. So, there is absolutely no doubt in uh, the mind of the uh, experimental community in astrophysics and cosmology that these objects, which are predictions of Einstein's theory, actually exist in nature. And uh, you go to Google and type Hubble telescope black holes and you will see a lot of data there actually, so I just pulled out one cartoon like this. So you don't see a black hole, you know, it's called a black hole for reasons I'll explain to you. But uh, you really don't see anything black really actually. What you see is accretion. That uh, here is a picture of matter being sucked in <coughs> by a black hole. So you, you, you see black holes actually in the sky by looking at, uh, by finding out it's uh, experimental signatures actually and accretion is one of them and there are several others actually which I can't go into just now. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about uh, what is a black hole. Huh? I didn't say that. So a black hole is a solution of general theory of relativity. You know? It is uh, some, something that comes out of the equations and the metric actually uh, or the solution looks something like this actually. Now, what is its most important feature? Most important feature is that if you go in, you can't come out. <laughs> That's the point. So, if you if you take if you take a if you take a candle over here or a torch and light it, that light can never come out. So, it look black. That's why it's called the black hole. This name was coined by John Wheeler, actually. That uh, this object is black. But of course, as I told you, in astrophysics really, uh, uh, you never see this uh, black object except by its effects. But that's another story. So, uh, this is what is a black hole. It is a, it's an object that occurs in general relativity and uh, in nature. 
But now, Stephen Hawking discovered some astounding thing actually in the 1970s. What he discovered is that if you, if you apply quantum mechanics to black holes, which are solutions of general relativity, then what you find is that uh, black holes behave like black bodies. It means they radiate at you. And this radiation is given precisely by a certain temperature, which of course goes to zero if Planck's constant is zero. If, if you put all quantum effects to zero, then this temperature is zero, you get a classical black hole. But if quantum mechanics is uh, valid, or you apply quantum mechanics, then you really get an object at a certain finite temperature. Of course, this temperature for a black hole of the size of the uh, solar mass is uh, very, very tiny. It's something like uh, uh, 10 to the minus uh, 12 degrees Kelvin. So it's not observable, but this effect is really there for a small black hole also. Now, what Hawking found is not only this temperature, but he found that this object just behaves like a hot piece of coal. Okay, it's some black body you know, that is radiating away. And this radiation is uh, called Hawking radiation. And you must have studied in thermodynamics that you know if you have a large thermodynamic object, then there is a notion of an entropy, right? And this is an engineering physics actually. They have entropy. And entropy basically tells you about uh, you know the uh, the amount of energy which is uh, in the form of heat in some sense or it tells you about the measure of the degrees of freedom of the system uh, as it was understood later on. So you have a thermodynamics of black holes, okay? And uh, <coughs> there's a very famous formula for this entropy for black hole which is just given by the area of this horizon. Okay. The horizon is a surface which separates the inside and outside of the black hole. If you are inside, light cannot come outside. Anybody has a question? Okay, so this, this is the story of quantum black holes. Now, fine, but there is a problem with this. And the problem is that uh, something like this is not allowed in quantum mechanics. So what is it? So you see, I said there is a black hole. Okay. Now, you know, you can take bits of information. For the, the nicest bit of information is the DNA, right? ATGC, you know, you just pair it up. It's information, right? On a strip. It's some software. You, what I'm trying to say is that if you throw it into a black hole, it gets scrambled up. And it comes out as thermal radiation. The laws of quantum mechanics, now I won't explain that in detail, tell you that that is not possible in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics does not allow this type of unscrambling or does not allow things to thermalize and come out. Or in technical language, uh, what you say is that a pure state cannot become a mixed state. A thermal state is a mixed state. But what I said before is also true that you, know, you can't uh, unscramble the information that you throw inside. So there is a problem. Okay. There is a problem. So, what do you do? Now, this is a problem which has nothing to do with high energy physics or short distances or anything. It's a, it's a problem of the tenets of the theory of relativity actually. And this problem was resolved by string theory. And uh, I think this is perhaps the most important achievement of this framework that it could resolve a paradox which is called the information paradox um, which occurs when you apply quantum mechanics to black holes. And uh, uh, what it does is basically that uh, it does the following. So I don't want to go to the next uh, slide, but I will just tell you what it does. Uh, you see, uh, when you take a piece of coal okay, and you heat it, right? so you know it, uh, and, and after a while, you know, everybody parties off and goes away. But the coal remains actually and it's glimmering, right? And that, that's your black body really. And there's a certain spectrum of the black body actually, that uh, how much intensity comes out at a certain wavelength. Now, 
you might think that you had the coal, it is made up of molecules, is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, all of it very, in a very complicated way put together. A piece of coal is a hajar information in it, right? Of the stuff that makes it coal and not something else. But when you burn it, they all look the same. Okay? I'm just uh, talking a little poetically. And uh, what you might say is that uh, the information of the coal is lost. And so there is a problem with quantum mechanics when you sort of heat something and see it disappear or burn out. But no, what happens really is that in principle you can really reconstruct the coal from the ashes. In principle. This is the point. Hawking's theory tells you that in principle you cannot do that if you have black holes. And uh, string theory resolved this question by saying that, Mr. Hawking, you're wrong. And uh, of course, he, there's a very famous story of how he withdrew his famous bet. But anyway, uh, what people realized is that string theory actually has uh, the degrees of freedom, the atoms that make up objects in the universe. Okay, Einstein's theory was just a mirage, you know, it was just uh, some sort of a, what shall I say, if you don't look too deeply, you will see a very uh, smooth space-time, but if you see very carefully, you'll find the atoms. Just like, you know, if you look at a piece of coal, you don't see the atoms, right? obviously you need a telescope to see that. I'm sorry, a microscope. So, string theory provides these atoms of gravity actually at the fundamental level. Let me put it this way. I think what I'm saying is actually correct. Actually correct. And uh, those atoms, uh, if you treat them appropriately, if you mathematically do it correctly, then you arrive at a very great uh, uh, unification of knowledge again that what was the geometrical entropy of the black hole, you know, given by Wittgenstein Hawking, is equal to the so called standard entropy which people use in engineering. That is the logarithm of the number of available states of a system. If you have a system of uh, 10 to the 23 particles, then the entropy is of the order of uh, 23 times log 10. Okay. And uh, string theory explained this equation. It's amazing actually. It was done by two very good friends of mine actually. Andy Strominger and Kamran Wafa. And uh, so that was a great achievement, that black hole entropy got explained uh, by, you know, just uh, counting the atoms of gravity, okay? And, uh, well, now this is a slide about what are those atoms, but that's too complicated. And those atoms actually then, uh, uh, you know, explain that the black hole is a bound state of those objects. And all the physics that you can sort of uh, uh, calculate, uh, you know, using, uh, you know, constituent objects and scattering and all that, which we do in ordinary physics, string theory enables you to do it for black holes and resolves all these important paradoxes with quantum mechanics, actually. So, this is really a great achievement. And I think uh, several people in Data Institute, in our group also, contributed a lot to this uh, understanding <coughs> of uh, the resolution of the information paradox which the general theory of relativity poses in the presence of quantum mechanics actually. And now all of this stuff actually, now we take another big leap, okay. Neha, you saying no, I shouldn't talk more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so, I don't know whether that's the general opinion. <laughs> I will, um, I will, I will end soon. But uh, let me, let me. Uh, so, so this is we are in the uh, early 1990s actually, and in 1996 actually uh, something very important happened, which has, uh, you know, made this subject. Uh, uh, even more uh, exciting actually, not only for uh, people interested in gravitation physics and particle physics, but also 
condensed matter physics, fluid dynamics, uh, stuff like that. So I just want to tell you that actually, how string theory actually is a theory of the unification of knowledge. You know, when you have a theory with enormous structure, clearly, you know, things which were previously very separate, you know, you understand them in a unified way. So just let me tell you a little bit of this, uh, what is this uh, idea. So now let's enjoy it. So this is the Maldacena conjecture. Maldacena is a young Argentinian physicist who was here last year uh, visiting the Tata Institute. He even gave a public lecture. Um, uh, and the conjecture is the following. So you see, string theory also, you know, in spite of all the work for so many years, uh, we have not been able to understand the complete theory. We understand bits and pieces of it. So is it possible for us actually in even one circumstance to understand or at least formulate the theory completely? And the answer is yes. And I think this is why this is a very great achievement. And it goes much beyond uh, uh, answering this type of question. And let me tell you what it is more or less. This is called holography. You know what is a hologram, right? I mean a hologram is, uh, you know, you have a three-dimensional uh, reconstruction from uh, phase differences in one lower dimension, right? So now the Maldacena conjecture is the following. It says that if you have a theory of gravity okay, in some space-time, this is a very special space-time, but nevertheless, whose boundary far away from the interior looks like something what is called the it's a hyperboloid type of space-time. Okay? There is a certain space-time. And you want to understand the quantum theory of gravity inside. You don't even know how to formulate it really, very well. What to do? The answer is the following. That there is a hologram of this theory on this boundary. And the theory in the hologram over here is something you are very familiar with. And you can calculate it very, very precisely. So, Maldacena conjecture basically which has been verified in innumerable cases is that a theory of gravity inside quantum gravity can be understood in terms of a theory in one less dimension on its boundary. And uh, this is an amazing fact, no? That, uh, you know, the, the theory of gravity in this room can be understood in terms of some theory we formulate on the walls. That's what the Maldacena conjecture is about. And uh, people have done enormous calculations with uh, this and verified this theory and made very beautiful predictions about the, the understanding of general relativity in the small. Okay. So, for example, if you want to ask, what does a black hole look like in this type of theory? A black hole looks like a hot fluid in the hologram. Okay, just take my word for it. I said the black hole is a, is a finite temperature object. You know, it's some hot object. But if you take a black hole's horizon and wiggle it slightly, okay, that then looks like a problem in fluid dynamics on the hologram. Okay? And one of the most important results that came out in recent times, which actually came from the Tata Institute by my very young colleagues, uh, is that this fluid dynamics over here is exactly the fluid dynamics of Navier and Stokes, but in the relativistic regime. So the fluctuations of the horizons of black hole can be understood to be equivalent to the equations of fluid dynamics on this boundary. So this is a very, it's a truly profound point because uh, you can now do a lot of calculations actually, which you could never do before. And this idea has been sort of applied by uh, you know people uh, to various uh, uh, different uh, areas of uh, physics, theoretical physics actually, not only string theory but also uh, uh, you know applications to strongly coupled fluids. I want to explain how it happens. Applications to problems in condensed matter physics, you know physics of high temperature superconductivity, and the physics of elementary particles, also to realistic black holes and models of dark energy actually. So. Uh, you know, a, a very deep theoretical construction 
is now available for us to address these questions actually. So this is the import of the Maldasena conjecture. It's, it's sort of uh, in uh, spirit and depth, perhaps even greater than the so-called Riemann conjecture in uh, the theory of prime numbers. Okay, so in conclusion, string theory is a new framework in fundamental physics. It's a framework useful for questions in cosmology and particle physics. And given its rich structure, it unifies either to disparate ideas of physics. And in this sense, uh, it uh, sort of also unifies knowledge. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now you can ask me questions. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the, the length of the string, that string length, uh, is fixed by the theory that you have. So at the moment, uh, we do not know uh, which of these theories really fix, fits with nature. But this length is of the order of 10 to the minus 36 centimeters. It's very small. Very small. Right? So somewhere around that uh, around that length scale. Could of it could become large? Well, if it becomes large, then uh, it should be observable, and we don't observe it actually, so it cannot be large. Actually, yeah. So it's it's a theory of the microscopic structure of gravity, really. Yeah. They're talking about black holes. Like they have all radiation since we talk about Hawking radiation. That continue a bit. What exactly? The black hole I understand. Then, uh, some all life. It means all radiation. Exactly. Continue about Hawking radiations coming out of it. Yes. Okay. So let me let me give you a uh, a description which is basically correct, but uh, as follows. So you see, in elementary particles, uh, you know that there is something called pair creation. So you can have a, a quantum of light, a photon and uh, it can become uh, electron and positron pair, right? E plus, E minus, right? Okay. Now, so what happens is the following, that near the horizon of the black hole, let's imagine there is a quantum of light and it sort of uh, spontaneously becomes electron positron pair. And one pair, one of those falls inside the horizon and the other one escapes, okay? So, what falls inside the horizon cannot be traced by you, right? Okay. So, this is what leads to the thermal nature of the black hole. Because there are degrees of freedom you cannot keep track of. You know, the notion of temperature and heat in uh, physics, I mean, engineering, has to do with the fact that you can't keep track of everything, right? So, if you can't keep track of these processes completely, you have a thermal description. And that translates into this uh, formula of Hawking and Hawking and Lecture, right? Is that okay? Thermal conditions are also part of radiation of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so it's, it's radiation of all types of stuff that. All types of stuff falls into a black hole. And this is radiation basically. Can you only you one issue and then 100 years later, yeah. you not talk about the craft theory of structuring the but in a sense, I was telling you that there is a cloth theory because the string is just uh, one aspect of it. There is a two-dimensional object. Uh, that is your cloth, and then there is. Then there is a spongy object, that's the tree brain, and so on. So, so it's all extended objects. So, yes. Just time as we know it, very, very differently as we get closer to black. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Very, very much so, actually. So, um, so suppose you are uh, very near the horizon of a black hole, and uh, you have a device, you know, which emits light of a certain wavelength. So it's, it's light of some energy, it has some energy. Now, what happens is that if you look at, for example, uh, if, you want to, if you want to observe this object far away, 
then this light has to reach you. But in order to reach you, it has to climb out of the gravitational field of the black hole. In climbing out, you lose energy. So this light actually then becomes a longer and longer wavelength. So if you want to really see something, you have to really send out light with infinitely short wavelength in order for it to really reach So this is this is the famous gravitational wave that that uh, that uh, time slows down as you get into the light. Yeah, the 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 the, uh, the the frequency actually of the light actually you know which uh, uh, the inverse of which is the uh, the time period the frequency actually uh, decreases as you go to infinity actually yeah so this is all because uh, of uh, the fact that uh, light has energy if if there is a gravitation yeah. Like there is a photon, and then we have a velocity of the photon, which is yes. constant. Yes. Is there any concept equivalent of the. Yes, yes, yes. Very nice question. Firstly, uh, the graviton is a prediction of Einstein's theory of relativity when you apply quantum mechanics to it in the small. So, this is the spin to particle I was talking about. That's the graviton, it's a massless particle. The point is that we have not been able to ever observe it directly. The graviton has not been observed like the photon directly. Like the photon was observed by the photoelectric effect. There is no analog of the photoelectric effect for the graviton. However, uh, however, indirectly we have observed it because of this uh, Hulse-Taylor experiment I told you. Uh, so that was this pulsar experiment. That uh, you know, you so the basic idea is the following: that if you have two gravitating objects going around each other, uh, then uh, classically the uh, there will be gravity radiation, and so the energy of this object will decrease and will start falling towards the center, right? So these calculations, uh, if you do in general relativity and you make observations, which was done by Hulse and Taylor, exactly match. So there is indirect evidence for gravitational radiation from these type of experiments actually, but uh, we have not really ever detected the graviton yet. So uh, let me go one bit further. I think the, some of the most important experiments which are planned in the next few decades are the experiments for the detection of gravitons and why is it so important. This is the only way in which we will be able to see the universe less than 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Because photons, the only photons you see are the ones which appeared free when all the charges sort of combined and atoms were made and there was no plasma and they were left free. So that is the glow that you saw, right? But below that, photons cannot help you, but gravitons will be able to help you. I think uh, the gravitational wave detection is, I think, one of the most important uh, experimental projects in the next several decades. And one of the most important experiments planned is in the inner solar system, actually. Three spaceships will act as interferometers and, uh, you know, the arms of an interferometer and uh, will be able to hopefully detect uh, gravitational radiation and try see some things about what happened in the universe below that time, etc. Yeah. Yeah. The reason for asking about anything equivalent of velocity of the gravity. Right. Is this the speed of light. The concept of action, uh, instantaneous action, yes. uh, is, is denied yes. on the logic that light has a time. Yes. So gravitron also has the same speed. Because it's a zero mass. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you still have the problem with action and uh, distance and instantaneous action. There is no problem because it's gone because graviton uh, propagates with a finite speed, right? So instantaneity is gone. It's gone, right? Okay. That's and right. The problem is gone. Exactly. But I took the opportunity to tell you about the gravitational wave detection, which I thought was a very important. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we said something about supersymmetry when you talk about strings. So <laughs> supersymmetry. 
Okay, uh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, it's not difficult to answer, but uh, um, so you see, supersymmetry is a symmetry uh, between fermions and bosons. You know what are fermions? Let's spin a half particle is a fermion, and a spin one particle is or a spin zero particle is a boson. Now. Most of our theories, in fact, all our theories uh, treat these objects separately. Okay. But supersymmetry mixes them. You know, it's like uh, you have coordinate axis, okay, x axis and y axis, and if you rotate it, you're mixing the two, right, by a transformation. So, boson, fermion, and there's a transformation that mixes them. That is called supersymmetry. And all the present theories of elementary particles use this symmetry in order to have good theories at very short distances. And so the discovery of supersymmetry at the LHC, I think, will be a very, very important uh, happening. And I'll tell you the reason why it will be very important, if at all it is discovered. Uh, there's something called the dark matter problem, right? That uh, most of the matter you see around you uh, and the one that we are really familiar with uh, all the time uh, happens to be only 4% of all the energy content of the universe, right? 27% is, or something like that, is dark matter. Matter which cannot be seen by photons, but which has been detected gravitationally, actually. Now, there is a proposal in theories of elementary particles with supersymmetry that one of the one of the supersymmetric particles, you know, is, is the dark matter. Is that matter which you haven't yet detected because you can't see it, but far away you have detected it gravitationally. And this matter, if you can find in the laboratory, the supersymmetry theories have a prediction for it. And so that will be a very big discovery that the physics of elementary particles in the small means less than 10 to the minus 18 meters, you know, it gets tied up with the, you know, physics of the cosmos actually. So, yeah, so supersymmetry has a very important role. <coughs> okay, I hope it was all right. I have another question about the Mathesina conjecture. Huh. Uh, so, like, why is it no longer like a theory yet? I mean, what is it based on that still makes it a conjecture? Okay. See, if you want to prove a conjecture, you have to prove both sides of it. Now, what is happening here is that uh, you can prove a lot of things on both sides, but not everything. Not only that, but one side is not even defined where it is most difficult. So, the Maldasina conjecture, I think, will always remain a conjecture, I think. But it will be very useful for us to explore the physics of gravitation. Yeah. This is slightly deviating. Yes. Yes. Sorry? The butterfly effect. Yes. Even minor alterations yeah, yeah, yeah. could be potentially. Yes, 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 yes. So, given the very uncertain nature of these fundamental particles, how have scientists today been able to identify these equations and conjectures? And how do we know that this is what it is? Because, even because of the butterfly change, effect. Okay, so let me explain. Firstly, let me tell people what is the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is an uh, effect uh, that was discovered by atmospheric scientists actually in uh, the problem of trying to understand weather and climate, actually, which is a very important thing. Uh, so again, you have to look at the, uh, the, the equations of fluid dynamics. Okay? Suppose you have uh, uh, you know, a fluid between two plates and you, know, you beat one from the bottom and uh, you can approximate those equations by the equations involving three variables. This is the so-called Lorentz system. And uh, the butterfly effect and all these type of equations have uh, chaotic behavior, which means basically that if you change initial conditions slightly, the final condition is vastly different. So you are wondering that if you are dealing with systems of equations which are so unstable, how can you arrive at the truth? It's a very important question. But it is also true that there are lots of regions of parameter space, quote unquote, in which this doesn't happen actually. And for example, if you want to study the spectrum of hydrogen atom, it's a good theory, the hydrogen atom, 
and uh, you can see the spectrum, molecular spectrum, all types of things, nuclear physics spectra. All those are experimentally verified. But there is, there are, there are possibilities in those theories with different types of initial conditions okay, in which you can have chaotic type of solutions. But not always. For example, look at the flow of water. If you just have flow of water, water in some canal just flowing, it's perfectly good laminar flow actually. But if piece of put a stone in the middle and drive the water, that's a different condition. And you will see highly unpredictable behavior, which is called turbulence. So the same system under different conditions behaves differently. And what I was trying to explain to you, the spectra of atoms, the spectra of molecules, the spectra of nuclei and all the other stuff of elementary particles, they're perfectly fine actually. There is no problem with that. You can think of it in terms of this laminar solutions of those complicated type of equations. I was just trying to be a little poetic and explain to you, but uh, that's the basic point actually. Yeah. Are they not interacting with other particles as well? No, but, but uh, that's okay. No, 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 no. So, so, no. So, so if you if you look at, for example, uh, you know, proton-proton collision, and uh, you see a huge shower of particles which are sort of detected, so those particles are definitive eigenstates, even highly short-lived, you know, of a certain here is Hamiltonian. They are eigenstates. They are like periodic solutions, and they are there, and you measure them. If you put a lot of them together and you do something with it, then you can get uh, unstable solutions also. But it, what I'm trying to say is that you know when you look at water, there is water, right? But it's the it's the solution actually of large aggregates of water particles in different boundary conditions that leads to instabilities. But we can't deny the fact that there's a stable molecule called water. Thank you very much for your patience. One last question. Yeah. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I mean, where is it actually deployed and used at the moment? It seems to be in the process of understanding the. Sure, sure, sure. A use always comes yes. later. Yes. See, we, I mean, let me say historically, I mean, uh, as you know, quantum mechanics was discovered by people who don't want to uh, do anything with the economy of any country. That uh, then led to, you know, a technology which revolutionized our civilization. The same is the theory of superconductivity, actually, you know, it was discovered by Kamerling Mons in the beginning of the 20th century. And it took uh, almost uh, six decades for us to understand the theory of superconductivity. So uh, you have to give time for theories to grow and, uh, you know, th there is no doubt that uh, what we have here is... Uh, I agree that it's it's the tip of the iceberg, but we do have the iceberg actually, and we have to explore it much more. Yeah. Can you find the you talk about constant of field of mind, but there are some entities which violate that uh, they move faster than. Is there still a? Let us say something about. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. So these are the stachyons, right? Yeah, yes. And uh, they, uh, but they are unphysical particles because uh, you know their their mass is imaginary usually. If you have a if you have a particle which is moving faster than the speed of light, which is a tachyon, then it's an unphysical particle. You cannot detect it. But George Sudarshan has some uh, ideas about all these things. He was here last year, so he's going to come next month. So. Yeah. At the moment.